It is 725. I will reconvene this special meeting of the Waco ISD Board of Trustees. We've been in closed session <coughs> under sections 551.071, 551.074 of the Texas Government Code. No action was taken. We'll move on now to item four, reports and discussion. Reports on purchase over 25,000. There's a written report uh, on page three. Are there any questions regarding those purchases? All right, then we'll move on to item 4B, presentation on Lone Star Governance Continuous Improvement. Dr. Nelson. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, good evening, members of the board, members of the public. Let the record reflect at 727. Uh, we have two things that we'd like to accomplish under our Lone Star Governance Continuous Improvement Planning. Uh, one is a follow-up from our last um, regular board meeting. Uh, we've actually been discussing it for the last two meetings. You can find a summary of what we're proposing for possible action beginning on page four of your packet. And I believe that it is a summary of everything that we discussed including the assessment screener, and um, I believe it looks exactly the way you requested it to look in terms of our new goals. Um, what we'd like to do in the interest of time is we've submitted it tonight. We'd like the board to take it. Uh, you can ask any questions you want tonight. Um, I am gonna ask Mrs. Benson to come to the podium and briefly explain the universal screener that we um, have implemented here and how we came to that conclusion very briefly. And other than that, the board can ask any questions between now and our regular meeting. Otherwise, this will be on the consent agenda. Ms. Benson, could you explain the maps, the yes. measurement that we're using in the zone and in the school district? Yes, sir. Um, uh, good evening, esteemed board, Dr. Nelson. Um, I, I'm here to talk about the MAP, Measures of Academic Progress from Northwest Evaluation Association. Um, MAP is a computer adaptive test, um, which means every student that takes the test gets a unique set of questions based on how they perform on the assessment. It allows us to drill down to the student and truly measure growth because it's not a status assessment where the same test is given to every student. This actually adapts to how the student is doing. It allows, it allows us to formulate growth goals for the student because one of the reports that we can get from MAP is a goal setting report and what it basically does is it allows us to see how many uh, how many points the student how many writ, um, at their writ level how much they would have to grow in order to meet their goal for the end of the year um, and this assessment also is has local norms it can be normed locally depending on how the students do in comparison to their peers it's also normed nationally. It allows us to look at how our students are doing compared to other students across the nation, which I think is really important for our students. We want them to be competitive, not only here, but with their peers nationally. Uh, it's based on, the test also is, uh, allows us to have a RIT score. Uh, when students finish, they receive this score. Uh, the, it represents the student's achievement level at a given moment in the school year. The test is recommended to be given at the beginning of the year, the middle of the year, and the end of the year. Some districts also give it in the summer. Students, uh, students take the, when they take the MAP assessment, the MAP assessment usually takes about 45 minutes. It can take longer because the test is not timed. And so as the student's completing the assessment, if the student is, for example, able to complete questions that are more difficult, then the student is given even more difficult questions. So whether it's a student that's in the gifted and talented program or a student that's in special education or a student that's an English learner, the test will adapt to that child's level based on their um, level of response. It it's, does assess the standards of Texas. 
um, map is aligned to the Texas Teak, so it will also be assessing how students are doing in that content at that period of time. And it'll address, it'll also allow us to address their goal over time on how they are learning the content of the Texas Teaks. So with that, I feel like we've discussed this at length and uh, we still have a long way to go in terms of Lone Star governance, but I believe we're on the right track and we've got some uh, quantifiable data, empirical data that uh, we can move toward. We talked about how we felt like the goals were very high, uh, some of them even above the state, <laughs> but uh, we're fine with that because this board has spoken about yeah. how we need to be more aggressive and urgent yeah. in accomplishing our student outcome goals and uh, we accept that as, as well as the standard. Are there any comments or questions regarding our Lone Star governance? Mr. Manning. Just one question. Yes. How long uh, has this uh, ICIP program been in the district? The I-Station program, it's been here as long as I've been here, and I've been here over three years. Um, I, I would have to ask. It started off as a pilot from mm -hmm. the state in 2011. Mm -hmm. And most districts embraced it then because it was free. Yes, it and was that it came out no cost to the district. It has since transitioned to a um, pretty expensive. Yes. But we believe in the data that we're receiving on the. Oh, that's okay. That's okay. I thought it was one of yeah. our staff. Yeah. I was like, well, we're not clear about this. Uh, yeah. Okay, but y'all, you, you can let your cell phone play as much as you like, Mr. Manning. Oh, that's okay, <laughs> Mr. Manning. That's okay. <clears throat> yeah, Mr. Manning, were you able to hear the answer while you were uh, distracted, having to, having to <laughs> shut that down? Did you get the answer to your question? And there, I have a, a document, too, for the board that has so, information. Over five years, yeah. Mm -hmm. Over five years. Yes. yes. I got yes. a professor, and I can talk to you about another question. Yeah, I don't mind telling you that ICIP is one of the uh, programs that I think you see mixed reviews mm -hmm. uh, out there, and some people question the data that we get from it. But what you'll find is in this district is that we're so data rich, I'm not sure we're even doing an, an um, <laughs> doing something with all the data we have. But it is a good data set and it's very quantifiable and so that's why we've included it. One thing that I, that I really like about MAP, and I did use MAP in the past um, as a principal, and what I found as a principal that I loved about MAP is that when we would get the student reports, we would get a writ range where it would allow us to have a mastery level, an instructional level, and a frustration level. And then it basically gave teachers a blueprint. So like if it would show the mastery and the skills the students had mastered and the vocabulary they had mastered, it would then go to the instructional level and what skills they needed to be working on. And, and then it would show the vocabulary that would be introduced at that level. And when you got to frustration, it showed again, the vocabulary that they needed to be working on and those skills that we needed to be introducing to the students. So as a principal, I felt that that was wonderful for my students because it allowed us to drill down to the student since the student adapts to the child. Other questions? All right, thank you, Ms. Benson. Thank you, Dr. Nelson. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Item B2, the WISD Literacy Program. Dr. Nelson. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, members of the board, you have a navy blue folder. It was developed by our Office of Secondary Education. And um, last regular meeting, we handed you a 157-page document that was our literacy plan uh, that had been worked on for the last 18 months. Uh, for the let the record reflect thank you let the record reflect that we will be uh, we're fast and furious trying to increase education of our literacy plan throughout our school community um, this plan is really intended for our public to understand our focus on literacy Teachers in WISD have been working on literacy well before this plan was developed. 
And a kindergarten teacher will tell you that making sure kids know their letters is, that's their life. That's what they do. Uh, and then kids at, uh, teachers at secondary will tell you making sure kids, I say secondary, starting as early as second, third, fourth grade, kids are expected to develop stamina in writing well-written paragraphs. And for us, literacy is um, the combination of being able to read and write effectively is one of the definitions that we would, we would give. We wanted to, we're not gonna read all of this to you in the interest of time, but we just want to be clear that this 157-page document was not done to just put on a shelf. And what we've done today is we've tried to provide you some highlights of the plan, an executive summary. I'd encourage you to read the whole plan. Um, but it, a good place to start is the tabs that we have provided for you. Uh, we wanted to make sure we communicated to the public tonight that the literacy plan was developed between campus principals, instructional specialists, special population personnel, including special education, bilingual ESL, gifted and talented, our 504 department, special programs including Montessori, dyslexia, library, librarians, and members of technology. All of these people were, have participated now we're trying to show uh, our teachers the fruits of our work and how it hopefully will serve as an organized way for us to present to the community how to make sure our kids are gaining skills in literacy uh, all the way up to adults. Uh, I won't go over all the, the goals of the literacy plan, but uh, they are provided for you on page five. And from the goals of the literacy plan, we established on page six a set of district literacy beliefs that were to inform and align decisions about instruction, assessment, resources, and best practices, which led to things like reader's workshop, writer's workshop, some of the things outlined on pages 53 through 55. Uh, we've now proud to report that our campuses have been able to adopt a comprehensive plan included guided reading leveled book rooms of more than 4,000 books, classroom libraries of 300 books for each literacy teacher to encourage independent classroom reading, literacy interventions for special populations, writing process curriculum, and uh, the list goes on and on. Uh, probably one of the most difficult parts of our literacy plan since its inception has been deciding what our assessment plan will be for literacy. And we've done this, you know, with all due respect to, your, to our board governance goals, I don't believe that you want us to focus on reading just up to third grade. <laughs> It just is one of the goals that we think is a barometer, a measure of how kids, how successful kids will be from third grade through their senior year. So we've had to have conversations about how our, if you know how literacy assessment works at primary age, early childhood, we start things on the first week of school, what we call beginning of year assessments. That goes through to middle of the year assessments. And then it ends with end of the year assessments. They are both norm reference and criterion reference, depending on the assessment. Um, and so we're really starting there, but um, beginning at grades, I'm gonna say second grade through fifth, the assessment plan is very different. <laughs> just as robust, just as rigorous, um, and it's multifaceted. It, ha it involves district level created assessments, campus level created assessments, previously released state standardized assessments, uh, and a host of other interventions 
and support materials that we're very proud of. At secondary, literacy takes on a whole new um, complexity. And you start really having to focus on uh, what we call the achievement gap, where you have kids in the seventh grade who are ready to write a junior level paper in the seventh grade. And then you've got other seventh graders that are still reading and writing at an elementary level. Um, one of the best and brightest aspects of our literacy plan involves our community support. Uh, I don't want to steal the thunder, but we have a program that is coordinated by uh, Trustee Stephanie Quarterweg, uh, and it involves literally thousands of community volunteers each week coming in and reading or listening to elementary age kids read. And the data on that um, outstanding community program is undeniable. It is definitely making a tremendous impact. It is coordinated throughout our faith-based community. And in, you could talk to any city, we're, we're considered a mid-sized city in the state, but we have more volunteers than Houston, Dallas, Fort Worth, and several other people who are trying similar types of programs. So uh, that's just an example of how wide and deep we're trying to go um, because of our partners at McLennan County Community College. Uh, we're really trying to add an adult literacy piece to our plan, which you can find in our plan as well. Uh, and the last thing we will say is, is we want to be clear that supports for special populations are addressed in individual sections to ensure that teachers understood how to differentiate for each learner. And you can see that in the presentation we have for you tonight on pages 83 through 111. And uh, whether it's gifted and talented education, special education, bilingual ESL, no stone has been left unturned when it comes to our literacy plan. Um, things to come are providing avenues for family literacy engagement to assist parents in working with students on literacy skills at home. Uh, we really want to have uh, literacy of programs available to our kids in school and outside of school, and we want to try and provide literacy programs for our adults who are struggling uh, with developing their own literacy. So we plan on having several presentations with this board. Really, the stakeholders that need to know about this plan, uh, they, we haven't finished that yet. But uh, we're, we're going to continue to communicate that through the rest of this first phase of our plan. I'd like to commend Dr. Scott McClanahan and Mrs. Grace Benson our assistant superintendents of secondary and elementary respectfully. Also our chief executive officer of the Transformation Zone, Dr. Robin McDurham. I know she shares our commitment to the development of literacy in our uh, Transformation Zone schools. And uh, the last two ladies I would like to recognize that have been part of this uh, movement that we call literacy are English, Language Arts Elementary Coordinator, Mrs. Donna Trigg, and our Secondary English Language Arts Coordinator, Mrs. Donna Morgan, uh, the two Donnas, as we call them. So we'd like to, so the last thing I'll say before I turn it over for comments and questions is that we've put together the framework of this plan. It's 137 pages. We've given you some key pages but we welcome the board's leadership, guidance, and I guess feedback on what you've received so far, what you feel is missing, ways we can, um, we can um, get to a higher level of consensus and collaboration, and we just want you to carry this, this uh, concept of literacy being our priority. Uh, we would just hope you'll in, engage as we have engaged because we believe it is a very special part of our plan. So at any time if you want to have special presentations 
Um, just know we're trying to align the district's literally literacy philosophy, our instructional practices, and our materials to ensure that all students are reading on grade level by third grade and remain on grade level to be college, career, and military ready. So that is our presentation on literacy for this evening. Any comments or questions from the board? Yeah, Ms. Tico. I, I, my, my thought was on um, such a thorough plan, how you're going to see that it is implemented on campus and what are the objectives that you are going to set and then see whether or not you are meeting those throughout the school year. May I respond to that, Mr. President? Thank you. Uh, your point is an uh, excellent point, Trustee T. Kell. And what I would say is, is that um, developing a literacy assessment plan has been a tough task because elementary campuses have a certain way of answering the question you just asked. Secondary, it changes a little bit. Um, I can, I can um, validate that at this point in the school year, we already have certain data sets. They are district level assessments on reading. They are previously released star tests that we've given. So you think about that. If we give a previously released star test in English one in October, think about that. Most of the curriculum hasn't been taught yet. But we're in there teaching kids how to read. There, there are certain books that have to be read, certain writing skills that have to be developed and tested on by the time they finish English too. So we have periodic assessments, to answer your question directly, that help us gauge is our literacy plan being um, used effectively. And it's not the only way. You know, one of the things is, you know, we really want to increase some, some stakeholder input. So I want parents to say, yeah, it's definitely a focus. Blended learning, we want people to be able to log on to our website. And because of our website, be able to access some of our six-figure programs that we've invested in. Accelerated Reader, uh, I think it's called Smarty Ants, uh, Achieve 3000. So those are some of the measurables, and we get reports on those weekly about how many kids have logged on, which campuses are, we have campuses that have 5,000 kids or 5,000 entries on Achieve 3000, which is a reading, writing, math, social studies, science curriculum, uh, technology curriculum. We have other campuses that have only 200 entries. So if you have one that has 5,000 and one that has 200, it's a very easy conversation with the one with 200 because they're not embracing the, because Achieve 3000 is in the literacy plan. Uh, we've had to do some things like expanding the number of minutes that we spend on reading each day. And so, you know, that's something you can go in with a stopwatch and you can measure uh, on master schedules. So um, there's lots of ways to assess the implementation of this, but ultimately, periodically, we assess our kids in reading and in writing and sharing those results with our principals, with our teachers, um, and with our, our public is definitely part of our plan. The last thing I'll say, which is very sensitive, but it's very true, is we want to be clear that we're not trying to have a literacy plan for the concept of just performing well on standardized tests. That is absolutely not why we believe in literacy. Reason why we believe in literacy is because it encourages kids to be more creative. It encourages kids to be more engaged. And our curriculum has to rise to a level of where it's not just sit and get and do multiple choice, uh, read a passage and tell me what the main idea is. We really want kids to read all different types of genres, everything from nonfiction to, I don't know all the terms, but uh, the point is, is that we want to be clear that this is not being driven by improvement required standards, or this is not being driven by standardized tests. This is, we want kids to foster a love of reading. I'm 45 years old today and I love reading one book a month of my choice that I pick. I've been doing it since I was 11. 
And so uh, we want everyone to have that love of reading. And it's something that cannot always be punitive, cannot always be tied to some kind of test. But I guarantee you, the kids that fall in love with reading by third grade, there'll be a direct statistical correlation on how they perform in SAT, ACT, uh, think about careers of the future and things like that. So uh, periodic assessments, though, is a specific answer to your question about how we're going to monitor the implementation of a thorough plan. Yeah, go ahead. Let's take it. So my, my thought on that is you could still have campuses that don't implement the literacy plan, but yet whose assessment data is still good. Point well taken. So I'm wondering how are we as a board going to look back when we um, look at the data in the end on um, on our reading to know that these are the can which one what part of this literacy plan worked and what didn't and then for our sake it's really I think you know the board we have control over the budget and um, if there are parts of this plan that we need to talk about budgeting to support um, we need to be able to say that the assessment supports that part of the plan. For example, I saw in here um, teachers' classroom libraries. And as a parent, I, you know, I um, noticed there was a great disparity between teachers' classroom libraries. Sure. And so if that's part of this plan, for example, um, you know, an assessment isn't going to really tell you whether or not that was an integral part of this plan. But then how are we as a district um, ensuring that each of our classrooms have libraries that support the teachers? Yeah, that's an excellent point. So I think if you'll allow us to, to put together some responses to that, I think that that's a legitimate question that with some research, we can show you our ideas. So I think about the budget. We've already uh, reorganized a lot of our what were regular purchases to implement some of these new ideas. But we need to show you what we did away with, what we've done now, and what we plan to do to the future and, and allow the board to make some decisions on if it really was effective. You know, another thing I'm thinking about, just listening to your, your outstanding comments, is I'm wondering if we really talk to the teachers, what they would say are holes missing in this plan. What are gaps? Uh, what are things that really need to be revisited because I know I speak for everyone who's an author in this like speak up you know because we we welcome that feedback we understand it's not we're not done yet you know, with the work that um, Stephanie's been doing with um, all of our volunteers sure I'd like to see some sort of um, uh, collaboration between that project although it's part of the plan if if that if the, our volunteers also understood how important these particular pieces are and what they can do to support it, for example, if they're in a classroom and they um, take stock of that classroom's library, if you have someone who's already committed enough to volunteer to read to a child, as often as these folks are, they're probably going to very easy, be happy to see if they can't add a few books to that classroom's library. <laughs> so I was also thinking about whether or not the um, our education foundation is aware of the plan and whether or not it I would like to see that their grant committee uh, make sure that their grants are made with the literacy plan in mind with the focus on uh, knowing that these are the things that we know uh, make a difference in the lives of children and literacy and could you help us as you evaluate your grants? So, Great idea. Just more ways we can take the plan and infiltrate it not only in our campuses but then to our greater community. Well, that's great. We'll bring follow up on all of that. Um, Other questions, comments? Ms. Yeah. Cordaway? So I actually was thinking through some of that too because we were talking about books. I was reading through the plan and making sure that Families have access to books. It's talking about how kids in um, lower socioeconomic brackets for don't have a, equal access to books. And I just was thinking of junior leagues um, push that they've been doing at the and looking at. I think 
this is a great example of kind of that collaboration, cross-community collaboration, when they do stuff with Family Health Center, and the Family Health Center prescribes reading to the parents for young kids. You know, I think that program is piloted at several clinics, but that's something that could really be, you know, maybe junior league, I don't know. Would love I'm to sure they would. I, I think this is the kind of collaboration that we can obviously um, Wake OSD is very committed to the students in this district and committed to their success. But I think that there are a lot of partners in the community who are willing to also commit to the success of these students. And I think just kind of taking a more 3,000, sure. from 3,000 vantage point to 30,000 and kind of seeing who really is doing this. But I also wanted to say, when I looked on here, the, um, you know, Antioch had been doing STARS book clubs for the past five, six years. We've been primarily using Antioch volunteers and kind of co collaborating and coordinating those efforts at two elementary schools. And we've noticed uh, great gains in reading kind of over this five-year trajectory, you know. And so, you know, I was reading this and I was like, well, it's kind of not really descriptive of what it is now. So, uh, you know, I can... Um, give you kind of a little blurb. Yeah, you want you want to rewrite it? Yeah, go I, ahead. Might, I might rewrite this because it's more yeah, it's go more, ahead. it's more Antioch is basically saying, "Hey, we are going to facilitate any congregation that wants to use this framework. We're going to support them." But it's really a collaboration of 41 churches within this community. So 41 churches coming together saying, "Yeah, we're going to go ahead. We want to we want to step in. We want to help the kids in this community." And I think that's pretty unprecedented um, in terms of the collaboration from from our faith community um, wanting to step up and so you know I kind of wanted to knock us down a couple of Antioch knock us down a couple of pegs to kind of really um, emphasize emphasize give honor where honor is due to these 41 churches that have said hey we're gonna work together for the good of our community and for the good of our students and so Point really really Antioch is just serving the collective Church. Well, it's important to know not only 41 churches, but in Waco, Texas, I mean, it's it's different faiths. It's not all God bless Baptists, but it's not just all Baptists. It is every faith that you would want to represent. There are Spanish speaking churches that go to our students and read in Spanish. So it's a very powerful community uniting activity. And we'll clarify that in our plan. And Take, we've received calls from faith leaders all across the country interested um, in how to replicate that model. So um, I agree with you that we want to give honor and credit where credit is due, but Antioch is the, I want to say godfather, but I don't think that's the right term to use. But. <laughs> I'm not, we're the servant of yeah, all. Yeah, so I know. You want to be on the bottle. Least, but. <laughs> but I do think, and I think you make a valid point about you do. the community, cross-community. I mean, that was frankly why, you know, Ms. Cordwag and I were asked to present at the No Needs Among You Among Us conference, the Nene conference, yeah. uh, on that very issue and, and your efforts to form uh, the, the coalition of faith leaders in this community and then and the implementation. And then uh, we were asked to do another presentation to the Baylor School of Social Work and the uh, Truett Seminary that Josh Caballero and I handled that, again, because I really it's getting attention that there are multiple congregations that have all aligned and said we want to do this collaboratively and have maximum impact and, and the numbers are unbelievable yeah and if i could say one more thing yeah. you know this i actually have gone into several campuses and have seen the forgive me because i don't know exactly what they're called but the the leveled readers yeah, yeah the leveled library and these are i mean there's just shelves of these books and they're they look really interesting you know the principals have said hey you can read this but we've kind of said hey we're going to bring in different books so that we have even more kind of variety genres different different books for the kids to read in case the teachers want to use that one we're not kind of double dipping but but i i mean those books they look really they look wonderful. They look super engaging. And I, if I was a teacher, I would definitely use them. And, and I will make sure and, you know, with collaborating with you that we rewrite that part. And, and I, I do want to say something. Um, I think it's so 
beautiful and humble what you're saying. Um, we've met and we've talked about so many things that you, you're, you're doing in the community, you know, through the collaboration with, with other churches. And I want to touch back on what Dr. Nelson said and bring it back to you and what you are doing. It, a, a book, we learned to love it because of the experience we've had with it. And so it's the people that are around us that help us love that book. And so I can rem I remember as a child loving the Island of the Blue Dolphins when I came to the United States because my teacher would read it to me. And so all of your volunteers, all the children they're reading to are going to remember those books. And that will become a special book to them. And so you're instilling that love of reading through what you're doing. Yeah, it's a positive association with reading. And there's 839 people from churches in and throughout reading with kids. So I think that that's kind of where the honor needs to be, is the people day in and day out, week after week, consistently meeting with a kid. 839 volunteers, but they're impacting over 1,600 students across the district every week. I mean, it's, it's a powerful deal. And you're right, that love of learning is what we're trying to cultivate, but you've also got the data to show you're having an impact on, uh, on the scores. I mean, they're the, the yeah. only two schools in the county Who's, or in the Waco community, whose scores have gone up consistently over the last five years are the two schools where STARS and yes. Book Club were, were doing their program over the last five years. So it's, yes. you got the data and, as well as that, that personal connection that you referenced that's Absolutely. really powerful. So, so oh, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, Ms. Tico. So Scott can the mic. Yeah, I have an answer for you. Um, one of the things, <laughs> one of the things that we've done to ensure, right. yeah. one of the things that we've done to ensure that um, the plan is actually being implemented mm -hmm. is we have spent time in five principals meetings so mm -hmm. far this year, going over parts of the yes. plan to ensure that the principals thoroughly know the entire plan, so that they are able to speak to it with their faculty as they're doing walkthroughs to make sure that it is being implemented, that they understand the frameworks, you know, how the reading and writing workshops are set up so that they know what they're looking for. We've done organized walkthroughs with staff, principals, instructional specialists, coaches, where we've gone from school to school and walked through classrooms with them so that we could have conversations about what we see that's working, what aligns with what we expect and what doesn't, so that they're more familiar with what that looks like. So, so then my next question was, uh, I continue to hear um, G2 students, parents, especially at the middle school level, complain that their kids aren't reading. That once they get through elementary and they master that AR program, that um, sixth, seventh grade, the kids have stopped reading So I'm wondering what we're doing, especially at the Atlas Academy, to make sure that this this should be central to mm -hmm. to that program, of course. But but um, that's where I've heard concerns expressed that kids seem to stop reading by the time they get middle school. So how how is this plan a, a change of that? You know, Mrs. T. Kell, it's a phenomena that if you look into it, now, you know, I'll go get. We're going to do some research and bring that back to you. I don't know why there's this huge drop off at secondary when it comes to accelerated readers, such a perfect example where kids can be accumulating thousands of points. And then those same kids get to middle school and they're actually reading. They're just not doing the accelerated reader. It's, you know, so I say they're reading. We really have no documentation. So let us examine that. I think the Atlas program should have an even more robust literacy plan. So if you and look in the actual plan in the gifted and talented section, you will see that we actually have an advanced academics reading list of, of books that are aligned to the AP English literature test that have been scaffolded back all the way to sixth grade based on interest in reading level, um, where there's a, a span of lexiles um, for students that that might not be their area of giftedness, so they might be a little bit below grade level to ones that are several grade levels above grade level. So that at each grade, there is a span of books that we expect students to be re exposed to. Um, in addition to that, you know, we, we run the challenge that we want to be able to 
um, assign summer reading and expect students to do reading outside of school, but when we face the reality that not all students have access to all of those books and that we have a large, um, a large population of students that are um, facing economic hardship, they can't go out to Barnes and Noble and buy the books that we need, and that we might not always have, you know, 120 copies of a book to give out and then make sure that we get them all back so that we have them for the next group. It just becomes a, a difficulty. So we are continuing to look for ways that we can get around that, that we can make sure we have books that students can read, we can give them access to them if they can't afford to get them. But I know that at Atlas, we have had summer reading lists, whereas at the high school, we've still not been able to get around to really establishing that. Um, but there is an expectation of the students to be reading. Um, however, um, when we face reality, we know that at the end of the day, principals are held accountable for star scores, and that's going to trump reading. And so, and that is the sad truth, is that, you know, if I have a choice of giving kids time to read in my class or working on star, they're going to choose working on star. So... Other questions, comments? All right. Thank you, folks. Thank we'll follow up. And we welcome any comments or questions offline as well. May I proceed. Oh, go ahead. On item 5A, are we all through with the literacy presentation? We are. Uh, 5A uh, is the uh, Memorandum of Understanding with Region 12 for Head Start Programming, uh, Dr. Nelson. Uh, Mr. President, I'd like to table this item. Okay, so we're not going to take action this evening? All right, then we will move on to next week's consent agenda. Uh, if you have any, I'm sorry? Two weeks. Oh, you're right, week after next. Uh, we're not meeting Thanksgiving. Uh, if you have any additions or corrections to the minutes, just get those to Ms. McCutcheon. Are there any questions on the budget amendments? Uh, item C is the health insurance consulting services. Mr. Dupuy, did they include the information you wanted in the packet? Yeah. Uh, Mike. Mike. Yeah, a couple of questions, I guess. I, there's some numbers in there concerning prescriptions that I'm, I, I guess I'm trying to imagine. I'm trying to imagine where that came from. Where the, the the numbers, the the demonstrated savings, I guess that uh, the prescription, the pooled. I, I see how you could know what you spent. I'm trying to imagine. I mean, and we're saying we saved this much compared to what? I guess would be Are the you question. talking about the the prescription uh, discounts that we've received through Express Scripts because of the partnership yeah, yeah, that other districts have? Well, it seems to imply that had we not done this, we would have paid X. Yeah, we. I mean, we. And that's do, the part that I can't see how you know. I guess right. we do get a a, a discount because um, Gallagher has several districts that. Okay, so we're also, getting a discount off of what all of Express Scripts other customers pay? From what I understand, the prescription cost. So the fact that we're using Express Scripts as the uh, prescription right. uh, distribution a, it's a better, vendor. It's a, it's a better deal. Right. I've got deal. that part. Yeah. <laughs> better deal. Do you want to answer? Okay. Are you in? No, okay. Right maybe, maybe, maybe you can answer this. <laughs> I think he no, might be able to answer What's you. that compared to? I mean, you've got, so, you know, so you've got a list of prescriptions that you buy. And we know that we buy 20 of these, 30 of these, 40 of these. The price that we pay over here, <coughs> and we can read the invoices. I can pull that price off. But right. we've got this other comparison column. So the comparison column, it, it, it's from. a comparison column against what the estimated discounts were for those prescription drugs under the old arrangement, which would have been United Healthcare, versus what the new arrangement is with Express Scripts, which is a, is a pool that allows deeper discounts that we're able to achieve with Express Scripts because many, many school districts have, are into this um, education collective. And, and the estimate is, what is it, $475,000 is the estimated savings that the district has realized off by being in this we, program. Off of what we would have paid. That's correct. If you were not with that, we estimate that the district would have paid 475000 more than what was paid. If we had stayed with the old 
prescription benefit plan. Weekly Nine Health Care's pharmacy plan, that's correct. Who would ever stay with United's health plan prescription services? I mean, I, I guess I'm sort of, I mean, it, it, I don't know what our total spend on prescriptions is, right, three or four million? Is it, is it that much? Uh, that, I don't have the numbers in front of me. That sounds about right, give or take. Okay. And uh, I don't, from my memory, we're saving $400,000 a year, so roughly 10%? Roughly. On prescriptions. <coughs> I'm trying to imagine how, okay. <laughs> With those kinds of savings available in the market, I guess that I'm, and it, it's, they cut that deal for like school districts only? Is that? No. It, Gallagher has a, a pharmacy program of which school districts are joining. Okay. But lots of people have pharmacy programs. I mean, that's... You know, I'm sorry, say it again. I couldn't hear that. Lots of, pe lots of people have pharmacy programs. That's correct. That's all I'm saying. I mean, that's it's correct. Not, it's, uh, in fact, I mean, Express Scripts is, what, $100 billion a year company? They do business with a lot of different people, right? They are, if not the largest, they're at the top two in the country. Yeah, right, right. Huge outfit. So they do, I'm just saying they do business with a lot of different people. And That's I, correct. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, uh, I guess, <laughs> what I'm being told, and I, I know that the way it's being presented is this is a unique offering. Mm -hmm. We believe of, it is. And... To the tune of four hundred or four hundred thousand mm -hmm. dollars a year, correct? That we can't get anywhere else. We don't believe you could. And, and the reason for that is we have schools that are going into there, and to the extent more schools join the program, the discounts improve. Express Scripts is giving oh. deeper discounts to the extent there's more volume. Okay. Well, I mean, okay, compare your pool, let's say United Healthcare. How many people do they insure? I Nation, have, nationwide. They're huge. I mean, I'm they're, sort of they're, they're the single largest insurance company. Right. In, but in the they country. can't drive as good a deal. I, I, <laughs> they may not share it with the employers. Okay. Okay. Uh, Question two, mm -hmm. and uh, what I guess I was really optimistic about originally with, I think, what Nick had probably presented to us was a negotiation with local service providers. I mean, you do have, locally, 1,500 people is a pretty good pool of customers. Mm -hmm. uh, and there seemed to be some optimism there that uh, he'd be able to negotiate some deals on our behalf, and I'm sort of wondering. That seemed to be a likely spot for Gallagher, Gallagher to possibly, I don't know, use a hammer to get us something we, we couldn't have anywhere else. Right. Uh, of, I'm, I'm wondering what's happened there. Well, I think that the, fir the first step, this, that's, this is a step in a process. And so the, the first step was to move the district to a self-funded arrangement, which was done. And we see and we believe that through, I think it was the month of September, there's roughly $600,000 of savings against budget. So we think that's a good thing for the district. Secondly, and kind of dovetailing with that was the Express Scripts piece. Maybe in education, but okay. <laughs> but the, the Express Scripts piece is, is the second part that we think is, is helpful towards that. And then down the road, uh, we would go into some direct contracting with local providers. We don't believe we're at that point right now. That's down the road. Okay. Um. To be clear, and I want you all to understand the reason I'm asking these questions, we did, we picked, uh, you guys are the highest price bidder on this deal, and I'm trying, I, it's important to me that if we're going to make that decision, that I pry back, what are we actually getting for our money? And again, um, I, and I'm going to say even the, the $400,000 estimate, 
on the prescriptions, I, I, it's a little bit hard. It's not real, real tangible. I mean, as you said, you call it an estimate, uh, and I'm still not entirely sure I understand. I mean, United would have sold us those prescriptions for, if we had just bought their network and gotten their prescription plan along with it, I mm -hmm. guess you all have the data to know what they pay for individual prescriptions. It just seems a little far-fetched to me, but have you got other people on their plans? So you see what they're paying for prescriptions? Mm -hmm. Why would you do that? Get them on Express Scripts. You're doing them a disservice. Well, <laughs> it's, it's their choice whether they want to do that. Understand by moving to another pharmacy vendor. I mean, there are trade-offs there. One of the big ones is you have two different ID cards for members, and some districts don't like that. They think it's confusing for members. You have a, you have a medical card, you have a pharmacy card, right. And so uh, they don't want to do that. They want to have everything under one, so to speak, umbrella. Hell of a way to spend $400,000. Okay. Uh, I think, so I guess what we will be seeing soon is some i mean I, i've we had a 10 basically a 10 percent increase over what the previous the first year is that is that what we're facing uh, i haven't uh and i may have some more questions i guess when we get to the uh yeah the stop loss deal uh okay okay yeah, yeah, yeah. right we're which i understand may or may not be it's just depending on your Claims drive premiums. I mean, mm -hmm. there's no, whether you self-insure or whether you fully insure. That's correct. Um, you can have bad luck or good luck on a given year. There's really not a lot of control over the health of your covered population. Mm -hmm. to, to, to Hopefully, the in the extent. long term, you could improve choices and lifestyle and some things like that. Correct. But uh, uh, unless we start negotiating, I guess, better deals from service providers, there's, there's kind of little we can do there. What I'm, I'm wondering is if we're, how we're going to alter our benefits offering, or is there, is there a strategy for how we're going to alter our, our offered plans uh, in an attempt to try to keep healthy? Well, we want, to imp we want people making healthy choices. We want them making economic choices, good economic choices. Uh, and in the long term, hopefully, save the district money so we can afford more in salaries is what we're after. Um, so sorry. that is also one of the... I'm sorry to drag you all through this. I know okay. everybody loves health insurance. <laughs> but That is one of the areas that Gallagher has worked very closely with us on is really looking at our plan design. Um, we, um, as we mentioned previously, um, when we took the health insurance proposal to the board, the district contribution, the various plans that we were considering, one was the richest plan, a PPO plan, which was really having a big impact overall on claims utilization. Um, so, you know, we as administration decided that we needed to do something to help alter some of the behavior and utilization. Um, so this year, uh, starting in January 2019, we will no longer offer a PPO. Uh, plan um, at any price right it, it will be HMO employees are having to choose primary care physicians uh, they will have to have a referral to go to a specialist um, again we're, we're trying to help employees with um, with management of their their health care uh, by having a primary care physician and also we uh, will be rolling out some um, wellness initiatives this year as well. Okay. Right. Well, uh, Mr. Um, thank you. So can you speak to a little bit about how we came to the conclusion to uh, recommend the highest bidder? Was there some kind of uh, when we did it back in 2017? So yeah, so when we um, we're looking for a consultant uh, back in 2017. We knew we needed um, a consultant that had experience in moving. Well, we felt like we needed 
a consultant that had experience moving a school district from fully funded to self-funded. Uh, Gallagher had that experience. We have been very pleased with their services. Um, they, we have monthly meetings. Um, I think you've even attend one or two of those meetings and they bring the information that we feel like we need to make decisions. Some of them are hard decisions. Um, in fact, a lot of them are because again, we know that we need to continue to educate our employees um, and to help them make better decisions regarding their health because ultimately, um, if, if that doesn't happen, we will continue to see um, high claims utilization. Was this procured through our Office of Procurement? Yes. And Ms. Trotz and Ms. Davis are comfortable with the recommendation? Thank you. And we had, um, I had had experience with a consultant that didn't know school districts and experience with those that did. And Region 19 in the El Paso area created a co-op and hired their, their consultant did not have school district background. They had a million dollar in the red program in a year and a half. So. I really feel like it makes a difference when your consultant has school district background because they understand the patterns of usage with health insurance. Um, it's very different from other uh, industries. So I, I've been very pleased with the quality of what we're getting from them. Thank you for that, Ms. Davis. Is Gallagher the only company that submitted a bid that has school district experience? Okay. Um, from what I recall, well, as far as moving a district from uh, the fully funded arrangement to self-funded arrangement that that I mean they there were three um, at that time we had three of the consultants come and present to us and they were one that had experience with school districts had the most. they had the most experience right the most districts. I think it's in there and at the time they were in the process of moving four other districts right um, I, can, I, can, I can speak so in the state of Texas as I'm sure most of you know the vast majority of school districts are in the program called TRS. Uh, and I believe there are 59, 58, 59 districts that are not, that are on their, on their own. And Gallagher works with, I believe, 32 of them. So we have, I mean, this, that's what we do. We do public entity work and a lot of school districts. So we, we feel very proud of working with the school districts and knowing how the process works and can also give you insight as to what certain school districts do versus other school districts and how it can impact you. I wonder if you put your price up so high because you knew it was gonna get recommended for renewal. It's, yeah, it's been the same. It, this is, it's the same price. We didn't, no price was raised. It's the same price we've had since inception. Thank you for the clarification. They were highest from the get go. All right, I'm trying to help you, Mr. Dupuy. <laughs> okay, yeah, no, I appreciate that. Yeah. <laughs> Tell me how school districts are, other than the initial signing up and I suppose the contracting, how is insuring school districts or a population of teachers different than the rest of the population? Well, that's kind of a broad question, but it's essentially school districts. You're claiming some expertise in that, and I think right, and we have it. part of our selection. So school districts ha have a couple different things that are different than other entities. Uh, one of the major ones is you're off in the summer. And with school districts being off in the summer, the majority of times when people are not working, it allows them the opportunity to use their benefit plan. Medical, dental, pick your, pick your coverage, really. So, th so there are patterns, and we can plan for th those patterns. Secondly, with school districts, Many times when, when a health plan, when rates are set for the year, school districts contribute the same amount of money for every employee, regardless of number of dependents, throughout the year. Not all other entities do that. Other entities will do a percentage. They'll pay 80% of the cost, 20% for employees. Others will pick dollar amounts, criteria, whatever that looks like. But school districts are pretty consistent in having that flat amount. So you can do good benchmarking against 
what do we do versus what do others in whatever the district or region that you're in also geographically and statewide. Additionally, we, can, it also, we, can, we know what plans are being offered with school districts. So you can compare how do we, Waco, um, size up against the Dallas's and the Austin's and the San Antonio's, Houston's, whomever. In terms of plan offering? Correct. All of that. And even plan offering, number of plans, types of plans, carriers, deductibles, co-pays, all that kind of thing. I'm, I, it sounds like the most important part of that to me would be planning for the cash flows and the funding during the summer months. And budgeting and process and budgeting and process too, because not all um, not all employers select their benefits and um, go through the process uh, like public entities do in schools, private sector in particular. I'm not sure I see the distinction there, but okay. Uh, okay. All right. Are there other questions on the uh, Re Re renewal for the health insurance consultant, Mr. Manning? Every year we try to give teachers, all employees, a, a pay raise. It seems like every year that a lot of that's eaten up by health insurance. Are we going to ever break even or are we going <laughs> to? No. <laughs> oh, no, no question. I mean, you know, like That's I say, or, I mean, are, are, are we going to have to uh, give a pay raise and have it eaten up by health insurance costs again? <laughs> I'm not sure that you want to do it. That's the will. Okay. We are working For on helping our utilization in our district. And that was one of the reasons why we had a plan design change. Um, we knew that the PPO plan was killing us, um, pretty much to say, um, no pun intended. <laughs> right. um, so hopefully, I mean, really, we just gotta, we gotta get a handle of the, on the utilization. Now, there can always be a bad year. In fact, the predictions are that one out of every five years mm -hmm. could be a bad year. You just never know when that, one year is going to be. That's why we have stop loss insurance. Um, so hopefully, I mean, we can't make any promises, but hopefully if we continue to educate our employees on the importance of them taking care of their health, um, again, with us having to tweak the plans like we did, hopefully we'll get to a point where we will not be in the red as far as utilization. Well, just so, so it's, with the, with there you go. Making you go. And, and making the employees go to the private, have their own private doctor, you hope that care. that will decrease? It's, well, we're, I mean, it will help the management, management okay. right, of how they use their health plan. And, and, and just, I want the record to be clear. I mean, as, in, as the premium's gone up, we've raised our employer contribution every year. As I mean, it's not like the insurance premium goes up and we're only giving them a raise that covers that. I mean, we're, we're increasing our contribution towards that premium in addition to the pay raise. Yes, okay. that, is, that is correct. And we've, we have done that for years. This requires a board vote, but no, I'll just leave it alone. We're hoping though we will get to a point where we won't have to continue to increase our district contribution. And so employees can enjoy their pay raise. This year, employees were able to enjoy their pay raise. Well, increase this year with us going self-funded is substantially less than if we had stayed fully insured. Right. We were looking at 30, 40 percent increases fully insured, whereas we're looking 18, 18 percent. So, I mean, there's steps in the right direction. There's more we need to do. Exactly. But we need that other, the extra guidance to make sure we're in the right direction and continuing down that path below that. Other questions, comments from the board? I have one, please. Yeah, Mr. Sykes. So with regards to wellness programs to offset the experience increase, are, are we looking at that program in terms of utilization? Yeah, in fact, I'm going to have Sue hand this out to you. Here are some of the initiatives that we are rolling out. Uh, so you'll have that information. 
Uh, we just closed out open enrollment last week. Um, prior to open enrollment, we had informational meetings at every campus. Attendance was mandatory. Um, so employees learned about the changes in the health plan. They also learned about the wellness initiatives that we are rolling out in Waco ISD. Our uh, flu shot clinics have been very successful. Um, we've been offering flu shot clinics for the last few years, probably last, I don't know, it's been a while, maybe almost even 10 years. Um, but we are seeing more participation. Um, and I, I mean, and when I will tell you, when we have the informational meetings with our employees, we are reminding them that um, it's important that they take responsibility for their health. Because if they do not, then we will continue to see the uh, excessive utilization and premiums increase. So at some point in time, we have to just take responsibility for our health and make better health decisions. Other questions or comments? I have one real quick. Yeah, but just looking at the wellness initiatives, I noticed annual flu shots, you, you know, have about over 500 flu shots. Is there any way we could potentially partner with I don't know, the health district or other maybe clinics that we could get nurses who could come and administer flu shots to every employee? I mean, is that something that we're look? Sorry. Let me speak to the, I'm sorry, Mrs. Botel, would you like to answer that question? I apologize. That's fine. Well, I just, I, my experience has been that the issue is not getting clinics and partners to help us administer them. There's only so many flu shots available. And so Waco's already turned in their request. When you talk to the health department, they've already requested their dosage, you know, for this area, but it's not enough for everyone who wants to get the flu shot. So um, it's even worse in some other urban areas, but uh, we can look at any ways to give more flu shots uh, to not only our staff, but our students as well. We, um, and so we had a flu shot clinic um, at every campus this year. Walgreens is who we partner with. We just have the best rate um, yeah. with Walgreens. Um, so they went to every campus and we <laughs> publicized that information and had, a, had quite a bit of participation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Ms. Sykes. In that regard, I mean, would, would you consider that pretty low utilization of the flu shot offering? I, I would love to see more. There's just some people who refuse and, to take a flu shot. And to that point with Walgreens, do we use any kind of voucher system or anything like that, that they can go to a Walgreens can, with yeah. a voucher? Yeah. Well, they don't even need a voucher. They just go with their health insurance card, and they can get it free. at Wal They can go to Target. The, any Really, any pharmacy provider that's on the, the network, they can go HEB, get a flu shot for free. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, other questions, comments? Um, just one observation. I, I, just, I want to be clear what the reason I'm, again, questioning this stuff, and I'm not. Let's go to the McGriff, Siebels, and Williams bid for 60000 We're spending $45,000 a year additional for Gallagher. The implication of what I'm seeing, the numbers in the agenda item, is that McGriff, Siebels, and Williams wouldn't have us on an Express Scripts plan. I'm not sure I buy that logic, but what I want to see is some more creativity in tweaking our offering or plan or incentives to, I guess, possibly alter behavior and choices so that we genuinely do realize some savings where it counts, and that's on the utilization. And I, I don't know how you get there, but that's really where you guys as capable smarter than everybody else, more expensive than everybody else consultants, in my mind, are gonna earn your keep. Because I'd rather, I mean, I'd rather spend the money on copy paper <laughs> and make it easier for teachers to get. I, I've, uh, okay, that's, that's, that, that's where I am. All right. Other questions or comments? All right. Uh, questions on the bid award for local retailer supply services, Mr. Dupuy. Yeah. Do you have questions? Yeah. Well, I don't know. I don't think you, you, you assumed, and I, 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 I think I've spent on 
question. Go ahead, Ms. Tico. Andrew, please. I'm gonna, I, I, to me, his prescription offering sounds like a catalog bid, or at least it's useful. <laughs> so my question is, we did one bid, uh, one RFP that met, netted 90 vendors, and I thought we were done. And there wasn't a need to, to reopen the process for another year, but yet a second RFP was published, and another 42 local vendors were added to the list. And so that, I, I guess, you know, originally the message was, we do this once a year, we've already done it, we have 90 vendors and we're done. But then I was surprised to see in our packet that another RFP was sent out, and another 42 local vendors were added, so. Yes, ma'am. What's the explanation? This is actually our third turn. This, when we issued the bid three years ago, we stated in our bid document that the vendors that were awarded on the first go-round would be valid for three years. Um, if the district felt the need to add additional vendors, we would add version two at the one-year anniversary date. Those new vendors would only then be approved for two years. And the bid again said we could do it on the anniversary date, which was this last time we issued this bid. Now these vendors are only going to be valid for one year. And then next year, the whole process starts over again. So the vendors that are awarded tonight, or not tonight, but next two Thursdays from now, their bids are only going to be valid for one year. And then we'll start the process all over again. We do this so that our local retailers do not have to wait three years to get back on the bid. We're, as I said last board meeting, we're trying our best to get as many local retailers to participate in doing business with the school district as possible. And we felt that doing this incremental annual additions is a benefit for employees, is a benefit for our communities, and it's a win-win solution. vendors on the original well that's accumulation of the previous two I do not have it separated for you ma'am oh I wouldn't ask me about that so the um, but which shouldn't we do that annually shouldn't we shouldn't we publish annually we do publish annually yeah. I advertise in the newspaper annually it's like a brand new bid it's just we don't lose our previously awarded vendors we get to keep them for the three-year term. And then round two, they're only good for two years. And then round three, they're only good for one year, and we start all over again. So are the local retailers that are on this list available to bid on any um, or to offer a proposal for any um, expenditure now? Yes, ma'am. Good. Thanks. Okay. Other questions or comments? Mr. Pettis. Yes. Mr. Pettis. Is this how you doing things? Is this a, a policy, local policy, I mean school policy, or, or are y'all just making things up while y'all go up? Huh? Well, it's state purchasing law, sir. It's what? State purchasing law, the way we issue our bids. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'd like to see it, please, if you could send it to me. Sure. The purchasing law, okay. local government code, I'd be glad to send it to you. If you would, please. 44031 and a 3 there you go. Other questions or comments? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Travis. Uh, e, the, any questions on the uh, bid award for special education professional services? Mr. Pui, did you have a question on the bid award for stop loss insurance? Is that what you, I thought you said that earlier that you had a question about the override. That's right. I can't imagine that y'all want to miss that. <laughs> you know, Harvey, I, I guess I was. You want to pull your mic, please? We have a new acronym, BAFO, best and final offer. The other thing, I guess, that I'm a little bit, you got, we got two people bidding on this. Is that all? I mean, it, that is a surprisingly small number of willing participants it seems 
I don't uh, think that's surprising. I think no, that. No, and I think that's, I guess I'm more addressing that to our consultant. I, I, oh, okay. Is there. Sure. No one has to go. Huh? No one has to go. <laughs> well, I mean, it's, we've got Sun Life United Healthcare, and I don't know. I assume that y'all recruit those folks, and. So the, so the process is um, the request for proposal goes out to the marketplace and we give the information out, claim history and so forth, and then um, let the, the marketplace essentially know that it's out there and they can choose to chase it and do what they need to do. With the, so much of it, as you mentioned earlier, is driven by claim experience. And what came back were the quotes from both United Healthcare um, and Sun Life. Gotcha. Um, I mean, do y'all yeah. get on the horn and call these guys and find out, hey, I want to make sure you didn't miss this, but we'd be, you know. I think there were 11 proposals that were, uh, RFPs that were sent out. Gotcha. Okay. Six, six, six have no response. Three specifically sent it back to you <laughs> saying we're not interested. Okay. Hmm. I wonder if the other. One of the, well. I mean, I'm not surprised because when even when we would go out for bid when we were fully insured, sometimes we were lucky to get two to three uh, proposals back. So I'm not I'm not yeah. surprised about the. <laughs> now, usually, what we're seeing these days, um, we've bid many stop loss for other districts uh, throughout the state, and we typically see two, three, four is high. A number of respondents, and I think it's a couple of things. One, it can be um, the the time of year, January one. It's the busiest time of year for vendors, so they they pick and choose what they can what they can get. Uh, secondly, if the claim history is high, they may not want to to bother working with it and and go after it. And so there are some entities out there that they don't like to bid on public business. They just think collectively it's a bad risk whether it's a, a school, a city, a county, I, I, I've seen it. So they, they don't even chase it. Because we so you're so saying stop loss. Well, it always no, it's just they think the industry is, it's a high, large claim industry, so they don't even go after it. It's just, a, it's like an industry decline. They don't even want to go after it. Mm -hmm. Where if it was private sector, it would be something different. United Health and Sun Life being amongst the only two that'll, I mean, y'all insure all these districts. Is that, your experience is fairly typical across all of them? Uh, it's, Sun Life has quite a bit. United has quite a bit. Uh, we see a lot of it with the uh, the major carriers, like like the Blue Crosses, the Aetnas, and such. They have it. Uh, there are some other ancillary carriers that that do have um, stop loss coverage. Sun Life is one of the bigger ones in schools in the state. But most of reinsurers are just are just not interested. In Correct. Okay, do we also, is it, is, it, is, is it United's network that we have? Yes. Okay, so we've got, and they're, they're re, providing the reinsurance. And then who's our claims administrator? United Healthcare. Okay, they've got all three. Huh. Did they bid on our full insurance? Didn't ask for it. Oh. Okay. We did. We didn't. Add, we didn't. We in the didn't, past, didn't, so in, in in the past, prior to 2018, we did get bids on on fully insured this year, though. Pre previously, we were with United Healthcare when we were fully insured, and they were coming back with the 40, 30, 25 percent increase. I got you. But since we've made the leap, we don't go out for bid on full insurance. <coughs> we don't. Is that? We did not in 2019. That is correct. I think we did ask for, for fully insured. insured. Yeah, we did. Yeah, that's what I thought. And the increase was sizable. Sizable. Yeah, that's what I thought. Close to forty percent. Okay. Now yeah, the rest of this gets. Uh, Let's see. I guess the only other thing. God, I hate to do this to y'all. No. <laughs> Don't. <laughs> I have to. The fully, okay, on the $150,000 specific 
stop loss. Our maximum exposure, what page is that on? That, look on page 99. Maybe that's what you're. So mm. maximum claim exposure would be 14,332,112. Is that correct? That's correct. Page, I'm sure it's not 104? Page 99. 99. On that. Second line, so you'll see UHC current and then UHC 150,000. And if you look on the one, two, three, four, fifth, fifth column. column, maximum claim, claim Keep spending. Keep going. Look on the screen up there. Oh, page nine. There right it is. there, right there. That's where I was. Sorry, where y'all started directing me elsewhere. Sorry. I had it. Go okay. Ahead. No, I didn't. 150. Maximum possible is 14,332. That's another page number there, too. Let's see. You sure that's not expectations? The $14 million number? Well, I'm just looking at, okay. Maximum claims, funding plus fixed cost. So that's the maximum liability of claims plus the premium for the, right. the coverage. Right. Why would I expect with the $200,000 specific limit, our maximum potential claims would be higher than with the $150,000 specific limit. You don't have to take me through the math on that. I'll have to think about that one for a while. Is it? I can explain why. Okay. Okay. Run that past me. Okay. So the maximum claim exposure is the grand total claims that would go towards that for the entire district, not just those with large claims. At the $150,000 level, that is the number of grand total claims up to 150 per person. Right. For an if you move to 200,000, then it's an additional 50,000 per person. Right. So in theory, the number could go up. Seems like it could. But it's lower in this example, or at least in this, what we've got posted here. We've got 14.2 right. versus 14.3. But, but, but the 14 million two is a combination of the claims plus the premium Premiums. level. So the premium went down. Premium went down by almost Three hundred thousand dollars, but the the maximum claims only went down a hundred thousand dollars. Okay, but the exp I mean, just based on those two, it seems to me like the two hundred thousand dollar specific limit might be a better choice. I'll but, explain. I'll ex but you have to look at expected, which is what you're actually you get this over here. anticipating, yeah. playing the odds. So on the right-hand side of that grid, if you look at the third column from the right, mm -hmm. there's an estimated expected number of claims. So, so how many claims, if you took the risk at $200,000, right. How many claims do you think are going to hit that? And from what fewer, our, our fewer, studies, right, fewer than if you had it at 150. So you, but you would be hitting eight people more, about eight and a half. I mean, it's fractional. I understand. Eight people more if you go to 200,000. You would, you would have eight people hit 200. Right. So you'd be paying 50,000 more for eight people. Right. So that's an additional potential 400,000 dollar risk to the district. 430 and then 270 and that's and so on yeah at a 175 that's correct okay now it's a guess if you if again, again i'm just going back to the max out of pocket or what i'm understanding to be the max mm -hmm. liability 14.2 mm -hmm. with the 200 and 14.3 correct 150 and it why is it counterintuitive to me let, that the 200 is higher let me explain okay so th look at the 14.3 so that's combination of claims plus the premium for the coverage. Mm -hmm. If you subtracted out the premium for the coverage, you're going to get roughly a little under $13 million. Mm -hmm. Okay? If you go down to the $200,000 level, you've got 14.2 and you subtract a million, now you have 13 million. So 
So it's a little bit higher, about a couple hundred thousand dollars higher. I'm just kind of doing the math in my head. But it's about $200,000 higher at that level on claims, not the premium. Remember, the premium went down $300,000. All right. Okay, so I should... <laughs> Okay, let's move. I, I, I've, I'm, I'm still not there, but we need to move on. I've, I've lost all my friends. I bring gum <laughs> every meeting. <laughs> Putting a piece so of that they, so that they love me. And it's, I've just spent all my capital. You need big Starbucks next week. <laughs> Mr. Dupuy, do you want to pull either of those insurance issues from the consent agenda in two weeks? Or do you want to make that decision later? Yeah, I'll, I'll let you know. Yeah, okay. Probably not. <laughs> okay. Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Only if I bring chocolate. Stop and shoot. Stop the loss. <laughs> Item G is the bid award for temporary labor services. Any questions on that? Really? All right. Uh, item. Okay. Carrie? <laughs> I'm just kidding. You're kidding. Uh, item H uh, is the bid award on the implementation grant partner for the transformation zone. I have a question. Ms. TKL. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm curious about why we need to spend $300,000 to pay someone to help us with the implementation phase of the trans transformation that zone that now is six months down the road. McDermott, well, you might explain what I, yeah. I would say while Dr. McDermott, may I respond? Sure. The, while Dr. McDermott makes her way to the podium, I would add that part of the requirements of the grant are that we have a partner that helps us uh, think about how we're implementing the grant. Uh, they've, and so, you know, I agree with you that most of the heavy lifting by design has been done by. Um, a host of local leadership, uh, including myself and Dr. McDermott, doing a, we're going to say, I want to say a majority of the employee work, but Empower Schools has been a good design partner in helping us think about what we have proposed, and I believe that they can serve as a, a high level of support to make sure we honor what we submitted to the state of Texas to earn this grant. Yes, you have anything you'd like to add, Dr. McDermott? Yes, sir. Uh, specifically addressing the timeline, we did not think that we needed to go out for bid on it. Um, I asked about it when we got the NOGA for the grant, and we had a response that said um, be, that you, sh you don't have to, we can give you the paperwork um, for it if, you, if your district opts not to go out for bid. So I asked for the paperwork, and then we were asked to go back and look at our initial process with them with the initial waiver from the state. Did that <coughs> waiver cover the two, both the planning and implementation? And I couldn't find where the waiver did cover both. And so at that point, without a letter from TEA saying that we didn't have to go out for bid and without coverage, I just said, we, we don't want to take any risks. Let's take it out for bid. And so I think my understanding is right now we're the only district that did, but I didn't have an assurance that we wouldn't that we that that risk was not going to come back to the district and then is the grant require a partner so when we wrote the grant we were under the impression that the grant does require the partner what we were not told was how much so the the other right now the other implementation grants that were after ours have a 20 percent requirement of the overall uh, award amount. Has but to go we, to the partner. 
has to go to the partner, but we didn't have that, and we didn't have to give 20%, even though the $300,000 is a large dollar amount, it's smaller than what the other districts are giving. So that was the first time that we worked with him in the planning process. That was a condition of the grant, and it was 50% of the grant. Which is how much money? It was 260000 for six months. So they've already been paid 260000 Yes. And this is going to be an additional 300000 Yes. And are they, are they, well, I'm not going to say they've been working for free, but um, so they've been working on the implementation phase without any agreement in place till now? So with the work on the implementation phase, the design partner was written into the grant. And when we got a pre-award letter from the grant that said we could begin that work starting at Ju July 13th was just a few weeks after the first grant ended. But we didn't have the official NOGA until um, August. No, no, not August. We had the official NOVA last month. And so although we had the agreement from TEA in writing to begin working with them, we, um, we didn't have the official award letter from TEA. Do we have a contract with them? This is the contract with them. There's no contract in our packet. Is there a contract? Okay, so. Can you get that in the packet? Yes, we can get that in the packet, yes. And who's, who signs the contract? Ms. Trotz. Oh, that's right, because it's over 50,000, Ms. Davis. I'd like to see the terms of the contract before next week for sure. Yes, ma'am. Sure. We'll provide it for the whole board. Okay. Other questions on the implementation grant partner? Uh, Mr. Sykes. Uh, Dr. McDermott, you mentioned 260 has been paid so far, 300,000 for the first year, but isn't there another 200,000 for a second year? 200 for the next year, yes. So total, to be clear. Total for two and a half years, 760,000. <laughs> well, and if we were required to follow suit with the other districts, it would have been a full million. Yeah, I know. Yeah, sure, sure. Other questions? Can you pick them in the lineup? So let me click clarification. Are you sure it's a total of 760 or is it just a total of 500? 500 for this year. You asked since the start. Right. I am trying to get clear on how much we've paid them since the start. So there was 260 on the original grant, yes. the planning grant. And then there's 300 this year for the implementation grant and then 200 next 200 year. 200 for the next year of the implementation grant. And then what's the grant amount? Five million. Okay. Right. Right. And then if you go back to the Right. So the two grants combined we get five point four million. Correct? Yes. Okay. So yeah. Let me answer that. Yeah. Let me answer that. I think that, <clears throat> first of all, it, Dr. McDermott's in a tough situation because there are very strict parameters given by the Texas Education Agency for this partnership. Um, I think the piece that, and I don't want to claim to know my board as well as I, I think I know them. Uh, this is, this is a. This is a complicated matter. And so we're committed to doing the work. Uh, the partners are welcome to join us in our efforts. 
we agree that it is um, exorbitant in terms of the fees that we're paying, not only in power schools, but lots of um, financial related matters. But one thing is for sure that Dr. McDermott and I are committed to keeping local control of our schools. And it has required us to jump some hoops, uh, bend but not break on some of our beliefs about taxpayer dollars. And your points are well taken about our partner. And I'm just proud that Dr. McDurham has been able to coordinate all of their input into a way I, you know, I don't mind telling you in front of our public that I value Empower Schools, but we kind of been marching to our own beat in Waco ISD and we've been in close contact with TEA, so we're not trying to do anything that's outside of their ideas. Uh, but we were working on this well before, we were working on transformation in Waco ISD well before we applied for relief from Senate Bill 1882. And that's, res that's respectful to the state, that's respectful to our partner in Power Schools, they've been wonderful, they've treated us with dignity and respect and professionalism, uh, but even if they weren't at the table, yes, we would still be doing this critical and urgent work and so, there's a couple agenda items there from time to time that involve the transformation zone that are a little vague and elusive, but it's tied to our relationship with TEA. And if uh, this board is so uncomfortable with the amount of money we're spending, then all the more reason you should expect us to improve the student outcomes in our schools, because that is the quickest way to not have to encumber these types of financial relationships that are tied to uh, Senate bills and House bills that have afforded us this relief. So that's where we're at. It's, a lot of books. it's, a lot, it's true, a lot of books, it's a lot of health insurance that we could use, salaries, we could put that in. So yes, the budget is a, is a serious issue. It's been, while it's well coordinated, I know I speak for Ms. Davis. We're not prepared to talk about employer contributions to health insurance next year, salary raises, none of that. None of that today. But it's Thanksgiving, so let's just have Thanksgiving and let us keep working on it. Other questions on the uh, grant partner? Uh, questions on the uh, Spring Break Academy compensation? Questions on the Principal Preparation Mentor Program? Stipend? Questions on item K relating to the report to ASBAC? Um, item L, I don't, know, I don't remember, discuss, are there any questions on item L? Uh, any questions on the uh, local criteria for tax non-graduates or the Lone Star governance? All right. Any other announcements, Dr. Nelson? Uh, no, we just wanted to remind everybody that we are in school all the way through to the end of the day on Friday. It's a regular school day for us, and we're excited about uh, the lessons that our teachers have created. We want to encourage our kids to be in class and uh, we want everyone to have a restful week next week off uh, celebrating Thanksgiving holidays and uh, we're thankful uh, we hope that everyone will consider what they're thankful for but I know I speak for the employees of the Waco Independent School District that on our list of blessings is the uh, Honorable Board of Trustees for Waco ISD, and we hope you, we wish you all a happy Thanksgiving. That's it. And with that, uh, <laughs> uh, we will stand adjourned.